Laura, good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Yecheskel. Nice to learn with all of you. Um, we're going to continue our discussion of Yecheskel Perekha, Yecheskel chapter 20. I think a very powerful Perek. And this morning, we're going to learn a very powerful part of it. So we're going to start from, again, Perekha, and we're going to start from Pasuk Lamed Bet. Um, verse 32, just one second. Um, so if you can find the verse, verse 32, we'll see how this goes. Ah, I closed the door and she just barged in. So if she can sit quietly, we'll do be okay. And if not, we'll take a little break to send her elsewhere. So here we go. Um, a brief overview since it's I think been a couple of weeks. Real, it's really an amazing Tarek in Yechazkel, um, chapter 32. Um, the Navi begins by talking about how these Zikanim, these elders of the people, approach Yechazkel and <laughs> ask to seek God. I'm going to return to that in a few moments. It wasn't exactly clear whether that was a positive thing or negative thing. Whatever it was, it inspired Yechazkel through the word of God to recount Jewish history throughout various periods of Jewish history, whether that be when the Jews were first in Egypt, whether it after they leave Egypt and go to the desert, after they receive the Torah, after they go into Eretz Israel. And the synopsis of it is that those are all missed opportunities. And sort of the Navi depicts this or this upcoming response, because we know that this was just a few years before the Be'am Mikdash was destroyed. And in fact, this is on the tent of Av, when in a few years the base of Mikdash was actually burnt down. That Hashem sort of sees that as the expression of mounting anger, that as it were, he was keeping inside of himself for all these generations. And the last thing we were talking about was these very difficult psukim. One of them was that Hashem said, due to their sins, he gave them chukim lo tovim, these not good laws, these bad, no good laws. What did that refer to? We discussed a few approaches. Um, some of them that if you do not keep the mitzvot, that they end up being to your detriment, etc. cetera. Um, and then also there was a focus on illicit sacrifice and sacrificing to Avodah Zarah and sacrificing not at the Makom Mikdash but in other locations. Um, and at this point, we now pick up the Pasuk Lam and Bet, which is fascinating, I think you'll see. And like many other Prakim in Yechezkel, um, it ends on a much more positive note. And in fact, we'll see quite an inspiring note. So here we go. We start from Pasuk Lamed Bet. Vaha'ola aruchachem, that which was on your spirits, that went up, that ascended on your spirits, which seems to be a reference to what you were thinking, your thought, your thought process. Hayalo siyeh, it will surely not be. It's not going to happen. Now, as I mentioned a few moments ago, the way that many interpret this phrase of that, what, what your thought process was, is a reference to these elders who had gone to Yechezkel to be Doresh Hashem with a certain thought in mind. And this is the reference back to that. And that's why some Afarshim are compelled to see that seeking of God in a negative way. So continuing here. So what you thought was going to happen is not going to happen. Asher atemerim, that you're saying, we will be like the nations, the families of the earth, to serve wood and stone. By my life, says the Lord God, I swear by my life that I will rule over you with a strong hand, an outstretched arm, and an outpouring of anger. 
I shall bring you out of the nations. I will gather you from the lands. Asher nifot so tembam, where you are dispersed. Biyachazaka ubizroa nituya ubechima shvucha, with a strong hand, an outstretched arm, and an outpouring of anger. Vehevegti etchem el midbar haamim, pasuk lamed hey and parakhaf. I will bring you to the de desert of nations. I shall judge you there, panim al panim, face to face. Like I judge your fourth fathers, midbar Eretz Mitzrayim, in the desert land of Egypt. So I shall judge you, says, is the, says the word of the Lord God. I shall pass you under the shepherd's stick. And I will bring you into the covenant. Okay, I'm going to pause for a second. Sorry about this. I'll be right back. Consulting firm McKinsey, as well as questionable spending choices by senior leadership. Where were we? So Pasuk Lamid Um Let's review Lamed Zion again, actually. There's a lot to think about here. I want to read until the end of the parak and then sort of regroup a little bit. So I'm going to pass you under the stick. I will bring you into the chain of the covenant. Or Bevritcha Masarkilachem, Rashi says. Masoret is like a, a passing of the covenant. Varoti mikem hamorden and I will, will clear from you. I will select or sort from you those who sin and rebel against me. I will bring them out of the place they exiled to. But they will not go into the land of Israel. You'll know that I am God. You house of Israel. And now it seems after depicting what will happen in the future. Now Yechaskel refers to this specific generation. says the Lord God, Let each man go and serve his abomination. And if you are not going to listen to me, that you not desecrate my name any longer. With your presence and your abominations. Ki bahar kachi bahar marom Israel for on my holy mountain, on the mountain of the height of Israel, the Um Hashem Lokim says the Lord God, Sham Yavduni Kobe Israel, there all the house of Israel will serve me. Kulo Baaretz, everyone in the land. Sham Ert same, there I shall desire you. Bisham Ed Rosh Ed Trumotechem, there I shall seek your donations, Vait Reshit Ma Asotechem Bachol Kachechem. And the first of what you lift up for all of your holy offerings. I shall desire you with a pleasant aroma. When I bring you out of the lands, the nations, rather, I shall gather you from the lands where you are scattered in them. I shall sanctify you. To the eyes of the nation. You'll know that I am God when I bring you to the land of Israel. To the land that I raise my hand to give to your forefathers. When you return, you will remember all of your ways and all your deeds. That you became impure with. 
Unakoto techem bif nechem. Two different ways of translating this. We'll go with that of the Abarbanel, who says you will be embarrassed because of them. With all the evil you have done. You'll know that I am God. When I act with you for the sake of my name. Not like your evil ways and your corrupt deeds. House of Israel, Naum Hashem Lokim. So says the Lord God. Quite a scorcher, quite a forceful prophecy. So let's briefly look at what we just read together from Pasuk Lamed uh, uh, Bet, verse 32, until the end of the chapter here in verse 34, mere 13 Pasukim. And what are the main themes? The Yechezkel is communicating here. What is he focusing on? Let's start with time period. What time period do you think he's referring to here? In in Mashiach times, that uh, this is the Geula. They're coming back to Israel, to Jerusalem. <laughs> yeah. To see yeah, 100%. And it's, it's, which is fascinating. And, and almost all Mephorshim say that, by the way. What's fascinating about that is Yechezkel is, is prophesying in the, in the first temple period, during the era of the first base of Mikdash. And yet he seems, and all Mephorshim, I shouldn't say all, but with the ones that I saw, agree that this is a reference not to the redemption, the temporary redemption of the second base of Mikdash, but rather to the Gula Hasida, the eventual redemption when the Jewish people will all return to Israel. So that's 100% true. So let's focus on this a bit. Um, I think we can divide this into sort of three parts. First, there's this, there's, there's this rejection of a certain thought that Jews had. Hashem saying, it's not going to be like the way you think. You think you're trying to say we want to be like the nations of the world to serve idolatry, to serve wood and stone. And that's not going to happen. Rather, and then Hashem describes this geula process. So let's go step by step here. What do you think he means? What, what are they saying? What's this claim? This claim that the Navi imagines is in the minds of the Jewish people, perhaps even in the minds of those elders who approached Yechezkel at the beginning of the parak. What is this thought? Will be like the nations of the world, world and serve idolatry. Like, what is their thought process here? Uh, I, mean, I don't. Yeah. No, sorry, I didn't understand the question in terms of what is the thought process of the. Meaning, is uh, it, is, is it, are they thinking, okay, we're like, is the point that they're saying, okay, we don't want to keep religion anymore. We're just going to worship idolatry. And that's what they're sort of, and Hashem saying, no, I'm not going to let you worship idolatry. Like, is that all that's going on? Seems like a strange, uh, does God need to tell them that that's like, is he taking away their free will? Like, is it simply Hashem saying, I'm not going to let you sin? Seems a bit strange, doesn't it? Well, it, seem, it seems to me it's like they haven't even understood what they have done. They don't even understand how wicked their behavior is, uh, probably influenced so much by, you know, what's going on around them. Um, at, um, in terms of like Christianity hasn't happened yet and um, Islam hasn't happened yet. And, and so I don't think in terms of religion, I don't know if they thought of... Uh, you know, what was going on around them, the paganism, et cetera, was sort of um, a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, a religion that was organized so much is that there was a lot of chaos and wickedness going on and they didn't recognize it as such. Okay, I definitely agree with the chaos and wickedness part of that. Um, I'm not sure, I, I think it's more than that. Meaning, and this is what many, many say, and they see this, by the way, Many in the Farshim, we're going to focus on the Abarbanel today, who has some fascinating things to say about this chapter, and generally, um, always a big fan of the Abarbanel. 
but many Mepharshim took a lot of inspiration from this specific selection in this chapter and applied it to the very predicaments that they were facing in medieval times. Um, and they see this claim, and this isn't a claim. I'll share you the words of a medrash that, that's quoted on this chapter. Um, it, re it requires a little bit of halakhic technical knowledge, but the main point, I think, is pretty simple to get. So the medrash says as follows. Just let me find it here for a second, if I can. Um, it should be here in a second. Too much notes over here. Okay. Here we go. That's one. Okay. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Atamotse, you find. When the Jews thought to throw off the yoke in the days of Yechezkel, to throw off the yoke, to rebel, to just sort of say, you know, tack with it, forget all this. And this is happening in the days of Yechezkel. And it quotes the Midrash here. It's in here. This is a, I'm quoting here from a uh, Midrash in Yalkut Shimoni, but I think it's really from Midrash Rabbah. It writes at the beginning of the parak there were people from the elders of Israel who went to seek God. And listen to the words the Midrash puts in their mouths. Amrula, Ben Adam. They said to him, Ben Adam. Meaning Yechezkel. Kohen ha kona eved mahu sheyochal betruma. If a Kohen, a Kohen is a priest, descendant of our own, Kohanim get to eat truma, special donations only a Kohen can eat, right? So if a Kohen acquires a servant and the servant eat truma, and the answer is, the answer is, Amilhem yochal, yeah, they can't. Yechezkel himself is a Kohen, by the way. Even though they're not a Kohen, once they're once they become part of the Kohen's household, they can eat. Amrlo. What if the Kohen now sells that serving to another non-Kohen, a regular Jew? Does that does that Eved, does that servant not leave the household of the Kohen such that he can no longer eat Shruma? So then they say, Amrlo, af anu. So too, we as well, we have left the dominion of God. Let's be like the other nations of the world. Or just like a servant who has been sold by a priest who can no longer eat truma. So what's the claim being made here then? It's not simply that we want to we want to serve what is our. It's more than that. It's the claim being made here is listen, God has sold us. God has forsaken us. God has sort of cut his connection, severed his connection with us. Now that that has happened, shouldn't the rules change as well? If Hashem is going to send us into exile, so maybe that should be a heter, should be, a, you know, a God selling, selling us. So that means the rules no longer apply. Right? That's the claim being made here. Very, that's a very striking claim. Maybe one some of us can resonate with. And maybe certainly Jews throughout history have resonated with. Look. This is it. In fact, and this is where the polemics really begin and how the, the Rishonim, the comment, commentators from classical Jewish history, really use this as ammo against polemics being aimed at them, where the Jews are saying, hey, listen, isn't it the case that we are no longer um, bound by these rules since we've been cast away into exile? Isn't that the case? 
That's what they're saying to Yechezkel. Niyak Hagayim, let's be like the nations. Isn't this relationship over? And to that, Hashem says, no. That thought process will never be. And this relates to the very forceful nature of the redemption depicted here, beginning from Parakhaf chapter 20, verse Lamed, da, Lamed Gimel 33. Let's look at it again carefully. And then I'll uh, share some of what the Abarbanel says with you as the as sort of the, the crux of it. He says, Navi says, by my life, says God. Right? I swear that with a strong hand, an outstretched arm, and an outpouring of anger, I will rule over you. Let's so let, let's uh, isolate those three terms: a strong hand, an outstretched arm, and an outpouring of anger. I will rule over you. Which of those stands out to you, and why? Of course. <coughs> Go for it. Go for it. <laughs> no, I, I was just wondering. Did you say which of those is not like the others? Basically, I guess so. Which, yeah, which stands out to you generally? Well, the Chazaka, actually, because I would have said Hamas, really? uh, but uh, the Hamas, well, maybe the Hamas. Well, uh, let's put that back then. Sorry to cut you off. <laughs> the first two terms obviously seem familiar to you, correct? Yeah. yeah. That's how God takes the Jewish people out of Egypt. In right. fact, there are many, this part of the theme of this prophecy is to compare this final redemption to the redemption from Egypt. Right. So it makes sense that Yechezkel uses the term. But then we have this chemash fucha, an outpouring of anger. Now that should sort of startle you. Whoa, <laughs> we don't normally associate redemption with an outpouring of anger. Redemption is sort of, we would think, you know, this is a very shallow, silly thing to say, but if we had to put, think about what, what sort of face God has when he redeems the Jewish people, it'd probably be like a smiley face, right? Yeah. You know, like he's probably pretty happy. I'm taking the Jews out of Egypt. So if it's, what's the chimash v'cha? But it's obviously sort of this extension of this claim the Jews are issuing. And what's amazing is the response. I Meaning the Jews are saying like, shouldn't we just say, this is it, our relationship is over, let's assimilate, let's be like everybody else. Now Hashem could respond and say, okay, that's what you want, fine, so forget you and I'll move on as well. But the, that's the exact opposite of what Hashem says. And this, you know, this obviously takes place over a very long history. But what Hashem says is, no, no, this relationship will never be severed. I never sold you. I never said our relationship is over. And therefore, not only do not have the right to sort of excuse yourself from the commitments of Torah and mitzvot, but whether you like it or not, so to speak, I will redeem you. I will, with a force, almost with an anger, ensure that you are brought out of exile and that you once again continue to follow my ways. I am not allowing this relationship to flounder, and I will make sure, I will make sure that this exile is not permanent, okay? And let me, I know there's a lot to say about this, but I want to cover a little bit. Now let me share with you, a lot of Mepharshim really, really go to town on this because, and we have to keep in mind the history of our people that these commentators, like a Barbanel specifically, who I'll focus on, but also I saw Ibn Kaspi and even you know classical commentators, all lived in a time of Jewish history when the Jews were subject to horrific persecution and exiled from one land to another, and also 
very challenging polemics where, as Esther mentioned before, both Christian, their Christian and Islamic counterparts made this claim to them saying, listen, you guys have suffered so much. Doesn't that mean that your God has rejected you? And if he hasn't rejected you, why do you continue to suffer? And the response in this prophecy that they all muster is no. It's exactly because he has not rejected us that we continue to suffer, i.e. Meaning if the question is, why is it that the Jewish people are downtrodden at this time in history, are exiled from place to place, and all these other nations prosper if you're indeed the chosen nation the response is specifically because god cares about us so much he's not willing to allow us to fall into this sinful behavior and therefore when we do sin he punishes us whereas the other nations of the world do not have that same relationship with him and if they sin, God doesn't really care so much. And that's what they say based on this, that regardless of, number one, the torture and persecution, and number two, even the assimilation itself, because keeping into context, taking into account the context these Jews lived in, many, many Jews, well, let's and, and, and here's where I'll, I'll get the three phrases in a second. We have Barbara Donald Turbot said, many Jews kept, um, refused to assimilate or to convert. When forced with the question of converted, I said, no, we're not going to convert. Some ran away. Some were killed. Uh, Kiddush Hashem. Some Jews kept the Torah in secret. Thanks. And some Jews converted. Some Jews could not withstand the test, Right? And what the, what the Avar Benel and others see from this chapter is that God is saying, regardless of whether or not the nation continues to follow Torah and mitzvot or says, okay, that's it, we're not going to anymore, Hashem does not sever his connection with them, and Hashem ultimately will still, despite all the torture, and because of all the, the suffering, will still redeem them. So they use this chapter as a response that, no, our being downtrodden and tortured is actually a proof and a testament to the fact that God still wants a relationship with us and will not allow us to ultimately assimilate and is punishing us for our sins. That's how they look at this. And that there will, at some point, even if, even if it's not an amazing tshuva movement, even if we don't all of a sudden wake up one day and start being these amazing people, Hashem is saying, I am going to redeem you whether you like it or not. Now, how that happens is not necessarily the most pleasant process. But that's the response Hashem is giving to this claim. Let's be like the nations. Let me, I know you should show you some of you some comments. Let me just tell you what, refer back to these three different phrases. Abar Manel sees these as three different groups. Um, he says there's the group of Jews in under Islamic rule in places like where the Rambam was in Morocco um, and other areas. And then there are the Jews who are in, you know, Italy, like the Barbanel was, who are subject to persecution under Christian monarchs. And that is the story of a Barbanel's life. Um, he was a very prominent Jewish leader, but also member of various governments, a very successful manager of finances who was exiled from land to land to land, Spain, Portugal, Toledo, Naples, ultimately then like he went everywhere and got kicked out everywhere. So he says the first two groups, the that refers to those Jews who 
who were faithful to Torah and mitzvot in these various lands and who in one way or another cleave to the Jewish way of life despite persecution. And the chemash bucha refers to those Jews who did not remain faithful, who for stuck, that's the right word, who um, abandoned Torah and mitzvot and said, okay, we'll convert and tried to assimilate. And Hashem is saying, it's not going to work. Not only will it not work that you, you don't, you're not free from punishment, but also, Abarbanel says, you'll never be able to truly assimilate. And this is something I think will resonate with you, that Abarbanel says, as much as you'll say, okay, we're not Jewish anymore, or we're just like you, you know, where we're going to be just like you, we'll dress like you, we'll act like you. We never get to fully shed the Jewish identity. And when it comes down to it, the, the, the nations will never say you're just like us. You're right. Come be part of us. They'll never say it. They'll always look at you as a Jew and persecute you accordingly. Mm -hmm. So that's how he looks at these different verses. And, and I encourage you to read some, you know, person on this chapter. You can tell, and the Arbanel goes into detail about his own life here and um, how this reflects what the, the, the reality they lived in. Okay, I'll take a few comments and we'll try to cover some ground. Esther had her hand raised. We all go to Sherry. Go for it, Esther. Um, you know, in terms of the Chemash Vucha, do any of the Mepharshim speak specifically to that? Because I get a, I have to say, it's such a graphic image because of the language of an erupting volcano and lava, you know, so that I would, it makes me think that when I look at the Yad Chazakah, Zrona to Yad, etc., you know, that they will have a harsh life, that they will be spread out, but that the that the Chemash Vucha um, and I, I could make an argument for why, you know, I get this imagery, the cham, the heat of the lava, it's been pouring oh, out yeah. from the mountain, et cetera. But that that would indicate, besides all those other things, that some people will die, that well, there's, yeah. going to be a, there's going to be a lot of death. The first two don't indicate death. That this one sounds to me like an outpouring of this death threat you know the death yeah threat. you know i think that's very clear as we'll see that there are going to be people who die and that some of the people who at the end of days who are unwilling to then pledge their faith will die in that process so it's very possible that that's true 100 percent. yeah sherry so I just had a question about why the Jews of that generation felt that the covenant no longer applied due to the loss of Jerusalem. We know that the Torah is given in the Midbar and that Hashem's giving us the land. It was always like a conditional thing as opposed to the covenant, which was more absolute. Like we were warned, you know, that we could we could lose fair, the land, but it doesn't. Fair. But it doesn't it, it doesn't negate the whole risk between Hashem and the Jewish people. I think you're making a good point, and that's the show point God is making. It's a good point, but I think, um, you know, you you live, and these I think this, this these are the people who live in Bavel, right? Again, I guess there's different ways of interpreting what these elders were thinking, but according to Medrash, you know, you were kicked out of Israel. If you sort of identify your Judaism with being in the your shalayim and in Eretz Yisrael in your own land and, and having access to the temple, etc., and then all that's taken away from you, that really could be a very traumatic moment in history and shake your connection with religion. So I think you're making a great point, but I think you know, in terms of what the human experience must have been like, we can sort of relate to those thoughts, right? You know, being rejected, it feels like rejection. It feels like rejection. And I'm sure there's also some of, you know, the Yitzhahara in there. It's like, hey, listen, it's been really bad. So, like, let's do what we want, you know? Um, but I think you're right. I mean, I think that's what Hashem is saying. I never severed my covenant with you. This is part of the covenant. That's exactly the point, which is also the response to the those who say Hashem has severed his covenant with us, um, you know, which, which is a classic, classic way of, 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 Christian polemic attack against the Jewish people. Now I think it's a bit less so in some circles where they say that covenant is is still you know um, permanent. 
But um, the response is, no, it's not that. God is punishing us because of the covenant. So let's move on a little bit here. I think we'll get to some of what Esther was saying. I just want to cover a little bit more ground here. So then God says, I'll take you out of all these lands with a very strong, held outstretched arm and the chema shucha. Um, and then there's a really interesting either metaphor or not a metaphor, depending how you interpret it. In Pasuk Lamed Hey and Pasuk Lamed Vav, there's a general comparison to the Geula, the redemption from its trying, and specifically an idea that God, Hashem, will take the Jewish people out into the Midbar, into the desert. What he calls the Midbar Ha'amim, and that he'll judge us face to face. What does that mean? God's going to take us into the desert. Very interesting. And again, you see that, and you have a lot of parallels here. If, if God is, Hashem is the Navi, is clearly drawing a parallel between the Geula from Mitzrayim and this redemption, speaks of, and when the Jews left Egypt, they went into the, the desert, desert, right? Mm -hmm. They yep. went in the desert for 40 years. So does that is that what that means? So some say yeah, and you know they, they say that at the time of the redemption that that um, the Jews will be taken out of their respective lands of exile and literally be in a desert. And the reason for that is also parallel to what we see in Egypt, according to Chazal and Makat Choshech, although maybe. The rabbis get that from this, meaning instead of learning from Egypt and understanding this nevua, maybe it's the opposite as well, that the, the reason we'd be brought into these deserts is that Hashem is going to punish certain groups of Jews who do not merit redemption, who will not be among those who are ultimately redeemed because of their sinful ways or their lack of faith. And rather than punishing them in their lands of exile and allowing the nations and their oppressors to witness their demise, God takes them, will take them into the desert and punish them there. That's one interpretation. That is what Chazal say about Makah Choshech, which we read about this week's Parsha, the uh, plague of darkness, where during that time, the rabbis tell us that there are Jews who were not willing to leave Egypt, who were not ready for the upcoming journey to Eretz Israel, and Hashem killed them. And he killed them during the plague of darkness, so the, the Egyptians wouldn't see it. Hmm. That's one idea here. But there's another interpretation that Barbanel offers, I prefer, which is that this is not a literal desert, rather it's the Midbar Ha'amin. And it means to say, and here it's really worth reading some of the words, or um, that the redemption will be a slow process and that the Jews will not go immediately, say, from where they've been for generations, get exiled and go to immediately to the land of Israel. But rather, they'll, be, they'll go from place to place to place to place. And these different locations are described as a desert in the sense that they're desolate for the Jews. They won't feel any sense of belonging. They won't feel taken care of. They won't feel at home. In that sense, the exile itself and the moving and the, the constant relocation from one city, one nation, one country to another is depicted as Midbar Ha'amim, the desert of many different nations. And that's the, and Barbanel is describing this from personal experience and knowing what has happened to the Jews after the destruction of the base of Mikdash. They go from place to place to place to place to place that that is the Midbar Ha'amim. And the truth is, and I, I you know, I, you like to read things like this, um, that there, we can even appreciate some of this more, that some of now, what the Barbanel says is maybe relevant to contemporary times and what's happened in the land of Israel. And he says that, I'll read you, is the, the, the hearts of these oppressed people will, will be inspired to run away with their children and their wives 
and to go from their lands where they had lived for a long time. And he even says from Mikarev Hanotzrim, among the Christians, to go to other faraway places. And they'll be forced to do so. They'll be forced into it. And that's part of the Chemash Vucha. They'll be kicked out. But he also says, it's interesting, he says that these, these, these Jews, will, these unfortunate Jews, will be forced to go there with the commandment of those kings. Um, that they'll be forced out. <coughs> to me, that sort of reflects not just what happened then, but even what happened sort of prior to the state of Israel, Jews being kicked out. Um, and that's how the Barbanel looks at this, the Midbar Ha'amim. Not a literal desert, but a, a figurative desert of, of generations of, of, of exile and displacement of the Jews from one country to another. And the Nishbati Ikhem Sham Panim Al Panim depicts a very direct, harsh judgment of the Jews for their sins. And he, that, that, but I'll just add parenthetically, and this is really just another topic. We have Arbanel also says that maybe it's a bit more literal that just like the Jews were in the desert for 40 years, that there will, this sort of period preceding the redemption will also be for 40 years. And he picks, he points to a 40 year period in his time. Um, he says, and this is something that many Jews of those times would do, they'd sort of make a prediction about when Mashiach was coming, um, and they tie it to all sorts of prophecies, and when he promised it to Daniel, he, he, he says that in 1464, when all these different exiles were beginning in Spain and Portugal, and he says in parts of France, etc., and I guess you could all do your homework and try to look into the history of this and, and, and the Jews in the 15th century. He says the 40-year period begins then, and he says it ends in this year as I write this in 1504. Um, now, I don't know if that actually happened. Um, Barbanel had gone certainly through a lot of persecution, and at that point he had settled more. I don't know if it was an actual national redemption, but you could see how he's looking at these prophecies and using them as a window into the divine providence in his own life and the lives of the communities that he led and the experience of the Jewish communities of exile and persecution and suffering and constant turmoil um, that they were experiencing. He sees this as a window to understanding that really fascinating, fascinating stuff. And then the Dalavi then continues here, and it, 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 as, as, as Esther mentioned, it's really not the most pleasant, you know, shiny um, sort of redemption. It's very harsh. And that's the, looking from verse 37 through um, 38, bringing them under the shepherd's stick, bringing them into the covenant and sorting out the rebellious and the rebellious Jews and those sinners. Um, the Mepharshim see this as, again, a certain selection process in that only at the end of days, only those Jews who remain faithful will be redeemed. But those who abandon the covenant at that point will not be, will not be redeemed. So there is, it does seem to be a very severe punishment of sinners at this point. And that's sort of the purification of the people, this sorting of those who are ready and those who are not. And he also says, the Barbanel says, the, the bringing them into the Brit is also a response to assimilation and intermarriage. That of those Jews, and this is uh, who who did really intermarry and assimilate, they will need to be brought back into the covenant because they had had then adapted a totally different lifestyle. They'll literally, maybe even literally, maybe even through a conversion process, if their children have literally intermarried and are no longer Jewish. But I think even just figuratively, if they've lived like non-Jews for so long, they almost need to be reintroduced into the covenant between God 
and his people. And that's, so that's sort of his statements about the future. And then in, in, in verse Lamitet, he sort of returns to the generation at hand. Um, and he says to them, listen, so says God, ish gilu love, in Pasuk Lamitet, verse 39, each person, go and serve your idols. Go and serve them. That's a bit troubling, isn't it? <laughs> uh, not exactly what you expect to hear from the Navi, Yechazkel. Go, go serve your idols. It's obvious, It's almost sarcastic, right? It's saying like, listen, I, it, that's, I'm not interested, in, and you see this a few times in the Navi, I'm not interested in what Esther described before, in this sort of like, you know, paganism, cafeteria, of God options, you know, you pick from one this day, you pick from one another day, we sacrifice to the <laughs> God, we sacrifice to this God, that God, and Hashem says, I'm not interested in that. I'm not interested. Listen, if that's the way you want to be, so go serve your idols and just, 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 and forget the, forget the carbono, forget the, the, the truma. I don't, I don't need that. In fact, the Medrash makes a point here to say, what's worse, Avodah Zara or Chilo Hashem? What is the worst thing? Serving idolatry or the desecration of Hashem's name. And the Midrash says, from this you see, it's the desecration of God's name, which is in a sense worse. In a sense, it's, I wouldn't say this halachically, although <laughs> none of these are, are viable options halachically. But in a sense, the Navi is saying, better to just shuck everything, be idol worshippers, rather, to, rather than to double dip. Rather than to, you know, worship God, but also worship these other religions or gods or deities or, or, or become part of these cultures, because those sort of reflect badly on, 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 on the worship of God itself. It demeans it. It demeans it into just another option among various options, rather than being sincere religion. A person who is totally assimilated is totally assimilated. So that, that doesn't reflect on Judaism. That reflects on that. But a person who... Who, who double dips, who does both, it almost makes it look like, gives the impression that, that that's how Ju Judaism works. It's just another of the pagan religions. And Hashem is saying, that's a chil Hashem. And I'm not interested in that. So go worship your idolatry. And, it, and he says, he, when he says in Pasuk, Mem, Ki bahar kachi meharom Yisrael no um Hashem lokim sham yaduni kolbe Yisrael on the, on the high holy mountain, that's where the Jews will Certainly, that's where I will want them. That's where I will receive their donations and their sacrifices and their tributes. But that saying is that I, I will only ultimately accept an exclusive service. That in the end of days, there will be no, there will be no com competing interests. It will only be the service of God, and then I will want them. And it's a very beautiful language. He says, in, in Pasuk Mamal, it's moving here. I will desire you with a pleasant aroma. A pleasant aroma. Now, reach nichoach is the term often made in, in reference to karbanot and to sacrifices. That reach nichochi, that the, 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 the true divine, true devoted service in the Beda Mikdash is described as a reach nichoach, the aroma from those sacrifices is a pleasant aroma to God. And that's one way of looking at this, right? That at, when, at the end, when we go to the Beit HaMikdash and to Har Moriah and, and, we, and we build a base of Mikdash and serve Hashem in return, that, that that service will be a reach michoa. But Abarbanel gives a very, very gripping interpretation where he says that it's also a reference to the sacrifices of the Jews themselves meaning the, the, the aroma of all those Jews who gave their lives, al-kidush Hashem, that that's the reach nichoa that will bring God to ultimately redeem them. The reach nichoa, not of literally the sacrifices in the temple, but he will desire them due to their commitment and their sacrifice to remain faithful to God, even in very challenging difficult times, even under the threat of persecution. And that's the Reach Nichoah that will, that will, that will, Hashem will accept at the time of the Geula. And again, he sort of, it, it ends here that you will know that I am God. You will know that I am God who swore 
to, uh, to, to bring you back to Israel. And there's also this embarrassment and shame that's if you look in Pasuk Mem Gimel, that you'll remember all the horrible things that you did and you will be embarrassed because of them. And this almost depicts, again, this sort of forceful redemption where Hashem almost reveals himself and there's a lot of getting kicked out of lands and, and, and being forced from one place to another, but ultimately a movement to get the Jews back into Israel. And at the end of it, Part of the tshuva process is that after all is done, it becomes very clear, right? And it's almost like the Jews at the end of days are able to look back and see how this entire process was promised by God. And he did ultimately deliver on that promise and bring them back. And looking at all that, it will make them say, wow. We're so embarrassed about the sins that we committed along the way. And, and now, and, and that's what Hashem says, you'll know that I am Hashem, your God, and I am not going to act like toward you the way you acted toward me. That's mm. the Pasuk Mandali. You'll know I am Hashem when I act toward you in the, for the sake of my name and give you this opportunity and bring you this forceful redemption. And I won't act the way that you're acting toward me. And that you're you're trying to forsake me. And that ends uh, chapter one. To get a, definitely a very inspiring chapter. A lot to think about and delve deeper into. But you can see how, and hopefully it's still, um, how this provided inspiration to Jews of many generations and still provides inspiration in our time as well. That despite whatever hardships there are along the way, Hashem pledges, I'm not, I'm not rejecting you. I'm not severing this covenant. It is forever. Even, and that means even in the face of persecution, even in the face of assimilation, I will ultimately redeem you, whether, whether you like it or not. And at that time, you will finally know and recognize that I am your God. So we'll pause here for now, and then Mertz Hashem pick up a pair of next week.